Hello from Providence, and welcome to our panelists and viewers from around the world. Uh, my name is Sean Kelly. I'm the Assistant Director of Career Advising here at the School of Public Health. Uh, today's webinar, which is the last in our fall exploration series, uh, focuses on public health careers in the public sector. Um, in our last three graduating classes, there's been an upward trend of graduates moving into the sector. So three years ago, it was 5%. Two years ago, it was 8%. It was 12% in the most recent class, uh, presumably because of the need for uh, public health expertise during the pandemic, uh, but would love to hear from our panelists their thoughts. Uh, for context, public sector positions were tied with consulting and nonprofit postgraduate plans for our alumni, which I think is interesting. And I'll share that in the chat box below our new outcomes page. So today I'm excited to welcome three relatively recent Brown graduates uh, who I'll now introduce. Um, thank you to you all for joining us today from around the country. Um, it's really exciting to have your perspectives and insights uh, to share with our current students and recent grads. Uh, you are alphabetically in order, both by first and last name, which I think is always fun. Um, so we'll start with Emma. Uh, Emma Cregan is currently a public health epidemiologist at the Rhode Island Department of Health, focusing on, on infectious disease surveillance and outbreak response. She has experience working on a variety of infectious diseases, including most recently COVID-19 and enteric illnesses. Emma graduated with her MPH in epidemiology from Brown in 2020. Next is Heather Ju Wong. Heather is a global health professional with around five years of experience. She's currently a consultant with the WHO, Department of Maternal, Newborn, Child, and Adolescent Health and Aging, working on a COVID-19 initiative in 20 countries. She's also a member of the Countdown to 2030 research team at Johns Hopkins and the exemplars in global health study on maternal and newborn mortality in Bangladesh and Niger. Niger, sorry. Previously, she worked as a program officer in the International Division for Jon Snow, Inc., JSI, and served as an AmeriCorps volunteer in a Boston public school. Heather completed an AB in public health from Brown and an MSPH in international health from Johns Hopkins. Welcome. Last but not least is Kavia Pemberton. Kavia is a public health professional with nine years of experience, in public health preparedness and emergency management. Her work has spanned academia, nonprofit, local government, and federal government. In her current role, she serves as an emergency management specialist with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Kavia earned her MPH from Brown. For everyone watching, uh, please ask questions to our panelists using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And we'll start with uh, the questions everyone submitted in advance when registering. So really excited to have our you know, very experienced uh, panel joining us today. And uh, we'll start with a question for everyone. Um, it has to do with Brown, of course. Um, how did your education prepare you for your current job workplace? And what is it about Brown specifically that you think uh, you bring with you to the workplace? I think I have a little different perspective because I did my undergrad um, at the School of Public Health. And for me, Brown was really the place where I learned the public health terminology, where I formalized my education in public health. I came into college knowing that I was interested in health in some broader sense and thought I was interested in public health and global issues. And so I really at Brown was able to take all these different classes and learn about the language and the history of health disparities, of um, global disease burden, of all these great issues and courses that are offered in the school. And so um, I think, yeah, that began my formal training and career. In, in the area and then also just being tied to a really great alumni network and um, the professors that I met. So that helped launch my career as well, like using um, the Brown Connect and the alumni that were available to ask them about um, the places that they were working and companies that I was applying to and asking them about their experiences and if those were places that I would wanna work after I graduated. So definitely was the starting place for, for my public health career. I pretty recently got my MPH from Brown um, in 2020. And I think that, you know, for my position now, being an epidemiologist at the health department, um, the MPH program gave me really foundational um, statistical and epidemiological skill sets um, with some really great classes and professors there. And I think that the school does a really great job of being really um, integrated with the local community and a lot of professors being really keyed into the issues that are affecting Rhode Islanders today um, through their research and just being really involved. And so um, that really made me want to stay close, you know, to my new home and, and work on issues affecting um, the state. So I think it gave me a really good sense of 
um, you know, unique challenges facing Rhode Island. As an emergency management specialist, I think I work in a non-traditional public health role. Um, and so though I am public health focused right now, especially being at the CDC, there tend to be a lot of people that come in from a variety of backgrounds, um, be it military or be it emergency managed in the, in the more general sense of like um, responding to disasters, doing more of the FEMA type work. Um, so I think when I was at Brown they really gave me the research side um, and the understanding of how research worked. And, I've, and as I've gone into these roles, this is something that has been able to benefit my teams as we're going out, not only the ability to um, do our own um, analysis of the data we were bringing in, and that's extremely important, especially now at the CDC, but also um, being able to translate the results into the programs we were conducting. Um, and that's something that I think was a gap for a while um, for other people, especially because they didn't have the public health traditional background. And that was something that we were able to bridge based on my background and my studying at Brown. <laughs> Great, thanks. And I, I think a follow-up question. So Emma and Kavia, you both have an MPH. Interested to know what your undergraduate degrees were in and what, in, you know, were they similar or did you find your way into public health? And then to Heather, um, you know, did your interest in public health kind of evolve as an undergrad because you concentrate in your second, or sorry, your second or third and fourth year? Um, or did you always want to do that uh, before you even came to Brown? Um, so I'd love to hear your perspectives on, on your kind of plans to I went to undergrad at Smith College and I did a bachelor's um, in economics. <laughs> so nothing to do with public health. Didn't um, think I'd go into public health. I got a minor in Spanish. Um, at that time, it was just what was of interest to me. Yeah, my bachelor's degree is in psychology and I had a minor in biology. Um, and that was from Seattle University in Washington State. So I think that, you know, that kind of allowed me to build on thinking about health a bit more holistically and um, you know how uh, mental health also can impact our physical health. And um, I, I really wanted to delve more into kind of like research skill sets and more statistical analysis. So that's why I pursued my MPH in epidemiology. Within public health, I've always been like interested, but it's definitely been like a circuitous route. And I think that's like a pretty common theme that you talk to people in public health that it's not really like a straight line. So I actually started at Carnegie Mellon for undergrad and I was doing international studies and it was a very like history, anthropology, language based um, program, but I was still very much interested in global health and I was hoping to like connect those areas of study and public health is so interdisciplinary that I was like, I want to take all these classes. And so I ended up in my second year deciding that I only wanted to apply to transfer to undergrad institutions with public health programs. And so that is pretty limited. And now I think there's a lot more just because public health is becoming more and more popular. But um, at the time, there were a handful, and I was so happy that I ended up at Brown because it really was the program. And I think it was like that year where it was changing from community health to public health, and it was still in the early stages of Brown being accredited as a um, public health school. So it was like this really interesting time to be at the school and part of like seeing the long history of like the professors and the research that they've done there. Um, and then my advisors like giving me advice about, oh, should I stick around and do my master's? Um, should I like go get work experience and then go back and get a master's? Should I do it at Brown? Should I do it somewhere else? And they gave like really good um, advice about that. And so I ended up working three years doing AmeriCorps and, and working um, for NGO and then going back and, and, and doing my, my post-grad studies also in public health. I think that's the theme of the year or even in my position uh, in that, you know, there is no direct path to a career in public health, which I think is exciting. You can explore your passions, figure out what your strengths are and go from there. Um, so I guess the next question is, what are your thoughts on the difference between like working for a governmental organization or a public sector position versus working for a nonprofit? Or are they very similar in nature? And it's just a matter of which positions you apply for. I guess I never really thought I would work in government and I still 
don't particularly like feel like my position is a very like government position. I don't know. I feel like the UN and, and WHO are these interesting like intergovernmental like multilateral organizations that have their own like system of their own that is both fascinating and confusing and and you have to like learn how to navigate once you're in it and so I don't know I'm coming from like working at a small nonprofit for like AmeriCorps um working at like a NGO sort of implementation organization, it gives you like a really broad range of experiences. So I think that has given me a lot of different perspectives. And I think I appreciate having all of the perspectives to kind of understand where I would eventually want to even go next or like in the future. And so I think what I see at least is that a lot of the government organizations feel bigger and like more systematic in a way and there's a lot more hierarchy and rules in a sense than and it depends on what kind of NGOs or nonprofits you're working for but um they might tend to be smaller and so some things that mentors have said to me is oh if you're starting out a career maybe you want to small start at a smaller organization because then you just get more like responsibility and opportunities so I think that's definitely something to consider like where you are in your career and what kind of organization you want to be at and I guess another another good thank you another good way to reframe that I guess to Emma and Kavia is did you apply solely for government positions or were you considering a range of options and how did you decide on the positions that you're currently in I think I can build upon Heather's answer a little bit. So um, I, you know, pretty recently graduated with my MPH and have kind of been at the health department in Rhode Island um, since then. But so I don't really have like a um, post-grad experience in a nonprofit. But, you know, what Heather was saying about things being a bit more systematic um, in government roles. Um, and, you know, a lot of our work is grant funded and that comes with some pretty specific um, goals that we need to meet and some pretty specific um, like program activities that we have to maintain and we're really accountable you know to the public um, and so I think that might look a little different than maybe um, like some private places or some nonprofits that are maybe funded through a bit of a different sort of a grant structure um, and I didn't really apply elsewhere it kind of happened that I happened to graduate during the COVID pandemic um, and felt like I was kind of being called to um, help out with that need locally. So it kind of ended up that that's where I um, kind of started off. Pre-MPH, I did work for the local government in Providence. I worked um, for a Providence Emergency Management Agency. So I did get that um, experience there. But however, when I left Brown um, after finishing my MPH, I was really just searching for um, an experience in a position that suited with what I was looking for, um, especially within the emergency management um, field. There, the options are much more limited than just the public health um, field in general. Um, so I was first started at a nonprofit. Um, and I have to say it was a great experience. <laughs> um, I now work for the federal government, which even given my um, time during local government is extremely different. I do agree with Heather when she says it can be a lot of hierarchical. Um, there's a lot of red tape. <laughs> there's a lot of um, things that really slowed processes down. And between the two, I remember when I walked into my nonprofit the first day, we had our big um, Monday morning meeting, they called it, <laughs> um, where all staff, it was an all staff meeting. And one thing that really stood out to me was that they were able to say, you know, we really want to work on this project, providing healthcare right outside of the national parks in Africa. And they just went, were able to go and start it. Um, projects don't move like that <laughs> in government. However, at the same time, um, I understand that I have, I'm able to have work on projects that have a wider reach. We work at the national level. Um, there, I'm able to be part of discussions and projects that 
affect everyone. Like we're talking about implementing the new changes that happened with entering the US um, in regards to COVID-19 um, regulations. And those are things that my, I working at a nonprofit, I would have never been um, open to. But again, to what Heather said, I think that getting that experience, my nonprofit that I work for was maybe I want to say 150, maybe 200, if I'm being really nice people um, in headquarters. Um, I think that it allowed me to get a lot of experiences that I would not have if I had started at the federal government, just because um, of how big it is. When your team is only three people, there's not really an opportunity to say you can't be involved in this. We need all hands on deck at all times. So I was able to take on a lot more um, leadership roles in the portfolios that I managed and the projects that I managed um, and building skills that I think prepared me now to go into um, government work at the federal level. Yeah, very enlightening answers. Thank you. Um, so I have an inkling of what you might not like about your current positions <laughs> in terms of red tape and logistics. Um, but what what do you like about your current positions? That's what I'd love to hear. You know, what do you what brings you joy when you go to work during the day? I think easy to jump off the last answer is I think in these roles you do get to see the power of like public health about the high level impact and like why. I decided not to go like so much of a clinical route where like I'm treating a patient at a time, but why I became really passionate about public health and global health. And so I don't know, like in these WHO or these other kinds of high level meetings, it's always cool to be like, who's in the room? Like, who am I talking to and who do I get to work with that? I'm actually making an impact in like health policy or health programming. And so just recently I organized like a huge global dissemination event for our WHO initiative on COVID and maternal newborn child health. And it included a bunch of the 19 countries that we included in the initiative and like the ministries of health and the government and policymakers and the implementing partners and the funders and just all those people being in the same like virtual room, like for this webinar and being able to engage in these discussions about what kind of mitigation actions and strategies have worked and what lessons have been learned during the COVID pandemic to apply to other different settings and, and learning about that on the country level and then how we can share that at the regional and the global level um, and all these different like cross country geography sector kind of um, engagements that, as we said, wouldn't really happen on the like grassroots level if you're just working at a smaller organization. So it is cool to be part of something bigger like that. And then, I mean, ultimately, I love like, even though there is the nitty gritty of like logistics or you know, filling out budget spreadsheets or all these forms and waiting for contracts. Like, I think what I love is at the end of the day, like I'm still working in like a field where I'm like maternal newborn child health. I love like thinking about the impact that like these policies and work might have eventually on like the people at the end, <laughs> but it is a very different level. Um, so then like direct or like management. So I think you also, I've, I've learned in my career, like, okay, where do I like see the most impact or where do I want to be or where do my skills really fit um, to have the, the most um, benefit? I mostly work on foodborne diseases. Um, I work in the acute infectious disease center at um, the health department here. And so I think it's, you know, pretty rewarding to get to work on things like food recalls or um, like outbreak mitigation and knowing that that, you know, has a real impact on um, the public. And so that's really interesting. And I think it's also really, um, it's always great when we get to do work with federal partners or with other states um, to think about things that are really impacting, you know, broader than the state. So yeah, I would say just collaboration with um, different partners and then also the work that, you know, directly impacts residents of Rhode Island. I knew when I was going to find a career that I needed something that switched up very often and frequently to keep me 
entertained. <laughs> um, but um, I think that is emergency management for me in general. You never know when things are going to happen and things are going to change. Um, for example, even just, I think it was earlier this week, my friend was like, hey, I'd love to spend some time with you. Will you be in town the first week of December? And I was like, yeah, as long as there's not a national emergency. And I said it jokingly, but I was like, oh no, that's very real. That would be the only thing that takes me away from you. Um, but at the same time, it's such a great experience um, to be able to serve in those capacities. Um, I think since I've been at the CDC, I was able to um, deploy and go and help out with the response um, for operations allies welcome which is the um afghanistan afghanistan repatriation mission that they were doing um and even that was um an experience in and of itself just to be able to assist with that um i've gone and done other deployments at a more local level <laughs> so within um around hurricanes um in florida texas puerto rico um, when I was with my NGO, and that even was a great experience to understand from state to state how health, um, how the health system varies so much, um, and how things operate there. So I think for me, it's always just being able to say, not only do I get to see the direct impact of my work, but also I'm always getting to be at the front line of these things as they're um as they're as they're happening so yeah. yeah it seems like impact is the the theme which i am really inspired by um so we kind of talked about having you know uh, a hierarchy do you think that working in the government kind of creates the five to ten year plan for you in advance um or how much flexibility is there to kind of shift gears um once you're kind of in the system if you will I think again, I have a kind of different perspective because I'm currently a consultant for the WHO. And so that gives you more flexibility. And as we were talking about in the government system, there's usually these like project grants. And so I'm currently working on a Gates funded COVID grant um, that goes until like early next year. And we've done one phase and then we've already are in our second phase and they're talking about a third phase. But I think when you're working for like these kind of grants, there's a degree of uncertainty in terms of like whether it'll be continued or kind of if you're hired for a specific project, if you'll have to like find a different position or if you're hired by the organization, if they'll just like move you within the organization to work on another project. Um, so I think that's something that I guess in a system like this, or even if you're working at a, organization that is getting US government funding, you also um, encounter that. So, and and I worked on US um, aid projects before, and those are typically like five years. And so you would kind of know the standard cycle of that. And if you would be in a startup or midterm or um, like close out. Um, so I just, for me personally, I think, uh, I think one of the questions is like, has this kind of work impacted your like five to 10 year plan? And I think, yeah, it definitely, as I said, gives me a perspective of what work looks like working for a UN agency. Um, also I've been fully remote. Um, so it's different than like, if I were in Geneva at the headquarters or kind of what that would look like. And I think it would be very different. So I think there are a lot of opportunities once you get into an organization that you can continue for um, more years if that's what you want to do. Um, it also opens up other opportunities too, like thinking about, oh, would I want to work in like a regional or a country office? I'm inkling toward like maybe not being so much at the headquarters level and maybe being more toward the direct impact, um, but that's definitely something that you can explore once you're in an organization and there's so many um, like offices or branches within it. Um, so yes and yes and yes. <laughs> I think it does like impact your your plan and and personally too I'm like I think eventually I might want to go get like a doctor in public health so that's also something that like in the next five-ish years um, like hopefully getting that like increasing responsibility and experience to, to really understand um, what that next step would look like. I think my answer coming from state government, um, I think that if 
you want to stay like in the state government for a really long time, you definitely can. Um, like I definitely have um, colleagues who have been there for a few decades that are really, you know, renowned as experts like in um, their centers and in what they do. And they have really strong connections to, um, you know, local community partners or, or um, you know, they've just been doing this for so long that they are great resources and really can give a lot of advice. Um, but I think, does it have to be like, you know, you stay for five to 10 years and that's your career plan? I don't think necessarily. I think a lot of people can also, um, you know, build some connections with uh, different partners that they're working with and realize that they want to use their skill set elsewhere. Um, and like Heather was saying too, a lot of our grants do kind of run on like five-year cycles or um, might have like a tangible goal to achieve. And, you know, maybe at the end of that, you find that you want to move on. Um, but I would say at the state level, there's definitely uh, like room to stay for a long time and really grow in your expertise there if that's what you want to do. Um, for myself, I don't think that um, reach, <laughs> working now at the CDC has affected my five to 10 year plan. Um, with that said, I don't think that I have a very concrete five to 10 year plan. I do think that for me, um, my goal was to be able to work at the CDC. And like Emma said, um, same thing at the federal level, people stay here for 15 years, 20 years. <laughs> till retirement. Um, I really think it's up to you as an individual. I know that there are people that will gasp if you say you would ever consider leading, leaving the CDC. And there are people that leave the CDC every day to go to positions at other um, at other companies to do work and go back to nonprofit to go to private sector. Even a lot of private companies are moving into out there. Um, I think for a lot of us that work in public health, the impact that we can have is always our top priority. So if you can have that same impact somewhere else, I don't really feel as though it's limiting. It really depends on the individual. Um, yeah. Great answers. Um, that's exactly what I wanted to hear that like you can be there for your entire career if you want to, but you don't have to be. And even within that, there's a lot of flexibility. And so I think that's good to hear, especially as like a new generation of public health professionals kind of work for uh, public sector jobs. Um, that's really helpful. Um, you know, the next question is about kind of like idolizing or idealizing organizations like working for Riot, Rhode Island Department of Health or the CDC or the WHO. Um, do you have any high level recommendations for like how you get to those kind of top tier organizations? Um, you know, because it's, it's oftentimes tough to get those right out of either an undergrad degree or even a master's degree. And so what, what advice do you have to kind of get to there um, if you're a current undergrad or a first year MPH student right now? That <laughs> a lot of people ask, and I think similar caveat, it was like, oh, I dreamed of like working for the WHO or I dreamed of working for an organization like the CDC. Um, and then I think I got to a place where I was like, okay, now what's next? Like, I'm still like pretty early in my career that and just like finish my um, master's in public health and, and there's still a long way to go. And we're just like in this pandemic now, but there's definitely going to be more and more pandemics. And there's, I think, always just a need for public health, um, whatever issue it might be. And so um, I think what I usually say is like network and it, it's, I know, annoying answer, but it's like hard to get in through just like the normal application process, I would say. Um, these online portals, like hundreds of people are applying. And so it, it helps if at least you talk to someone beforehand to even understand what the position or the environment is like. So that even in your cover letter, or if you get to the point where you speak to anyone that you at least have done your homework and you can not just regurgitate what's generic on the website. Um, but yeah, like I got to my role because of a recommendation from my professor, from my academic advisor, who someone came to her who was in the Hopkins network and said, I am looking for a consultant. Do you have anyone, a grad student who is 
how it doesn't have a practicum or it, that you would recommend and that is how I made the connection and so again it wasn't ever like sometimes these roles aren't like publicly posted or like you just have to kind of keep an eye out but also I found that if I tell my advisors my like mentors my colleagues like this is what i'm looking for this is kind of the geographic or technical area this is the kind of organizations i would like and then it's helpful because then other people are also looking out for opportunities for you and if they see something they'll pass it to you and if they know someone then it's even better because that connection could really make the difference of like whether your application gets looked at or you get an interview so I think like going to a school like Brown, you get an incredible network. And so it's like, take advantage of that. And like, even on like LinkedIn, like find who's at the organizations or on Brown Connect. And, and those people are usually willing to help you out. So I think I would have a similar answer of use your network and, and think about um, if you want to go towards the public sector, what level of governmental organization you would want to work with. and. Um, you know, in this panel, we have three very different levels of, you know, um, different types of organizations. And I think that, um, you know, it might be great to talk to people at all those different levels. And even if you're more interested, not at the state level, but a local governor, or, uh, you know, like a local board of health, something like that, if you even want to go, um, you know, more at the individual level. So um, I would think about what level you want to go at, talk to people working at all those levels. And if you can do a practicum or an internship or something like that, um, where you think you might want to be during your undergrad or your MPH, um, that might tell you if you want to be there kind of longer term. And if not, you know, what you didn't like about it can help you find your next opportunity. Um, that's what I was saying. I think that especially as a person who did this, um, I would just make sure that when you're thinking about the CDC or the WHO specifically in, um, for us, since we're all public health, um, not to put them on a pedestal, I think we tend to and I think I think sometimes you can get there and that can make it disappointing because just with like with any organization, they have their pros and they have their cons, some of which we've mentioned already. But um, I think that can be very disappointing for someone that comes in and they think that this is their dream job and they start to hit the red tape or things aren't flowing the way they want or they realize promotions don't work the same way they work in um, when you're in nonprofit or the private sector. Um, I definitely agree with both Heather and Emma about networking. Um, networking in any field will always change everything for you, even if it's just um, to the extent of the networking that Heather did, I believe, right before you were about to graduate, where she was asking an alumni, would you work for this company? Would you not? What did you like about your job? Um, I think I used a lot of the time before I got to the CDC to find out what I liked and didn't like within my field and within public health and helping to narrow those things down um, are very important for the entire trajectory of your career. So now when people, because you'll always get a lot of offers and I feel like even here, um, oh, do you want to do you want to be a plan writer? No, I don't. <laughs> I do not want to write plans anymore. I will gladly write an exercise. I'll do that, but I don't want to do this. I also think it's important not to um, downplay the skills that you um, gather before you reach that level. I always remember that when I got this position and they were government interviews are very they're very weird. They're very quiet. <laughs> they don't say stick to the script and that. So I didn't really know, you know, how I did or but I remember when I first joined and one of the um, the deputy director that interviewed me, she was very impressed with my background and my experience. And she was impressed that I would have all of this experience, especially at my age um, and or how long I had been in public health so that don't downplay those things you are um, those skills you are gaining before you get there, they're just as valuable to them um, when you get there. I remember my old director at my last job, oh, she used to say that, you know, it, um, because it can be very difficult to get into public health at any level <laughs> in any um, sector. And one thing she used to say was, you know, I knew I wanted to be in public health and I wanted to be um, facilitator and go out and do training. So she started doing, I think she did, um, 
some type of adult education trainings before then and that built up her skills. So she had some type of record of doing that. And I still see that to this day of things where I didn't know how they were going to connect into where I wanted to be when I got there. I'll put there in quotes because I don't really know if I'm there or um, if I'm there, but still, um, I didn't realize that it was going to be such a big deal that people were very happy now at my job at the CDC that I'm in excellent facilitator because I spent my entire career facilitating exercises and trainings for different audiences or that they were really happy that you um, knew how to communicate all this research with people that were non-technical. And these are sometimes things that we take for granted, but that can really be um, impressive to others when you're applying for these jobs. I will say that I applied through one of the general <laughs> portals. Um, it was during the pandemic though. So I do feel like there's a lot of grace that happens when you're applying for public health jobs during the pandemic, um, especially um, because they needed so much assistance. I think with any job, but definitely if you're looking for jobs at the federal level, flexibility, um, flexibility in what teams you're working for, what centers you're working for, where you're willing to live is a big one because um, I always see postings like there's one open position in Colorado. And it's like, well, do you want to go to Colorado? There's an open position, but the more flexible you are, even if it's for a year or two years, it does start to help you get into the system. Um, I applied through, right now is also a great time to apply for roles in general, just because we are still in the pandemic and we still are doing work at the national level and international, at every level in public health. Um, in a lot of the positions, right now are listed as direct hire. And so at the federal level, that means they they cut through a lot of the processes that tend to weed people out. So they're getting a lot more people are able to get into these positions. Um, and also if you're able to, a lot of these, um, there are a lot of internship programs after you've, um, or fellowships after you've finished your MPH, I think after you've finished your bachelor's to, um, to get experience at the federal level. And I know a lot of those um, fellows tend to turn into full-time positions. So look into those. And don't downplay the term positions. One thing I found out when I got here was like, oh no, everyone spends the first seven years at federal government as a um, term position. We just keep going back to the next term position. So uh, I know permanent is always what we're looking for, but I think I found in every sector that I've worked in is that there's a little bit of insecurity and job security, whether it's because you're um, funded by grants or by donors or because you're just on a term position. So be open to those as well. Since receiving your master's degree, do you feel that rising to a more mid-level position with your organization has been more achievable or is it years of experience valued more than degrees? That's a great question. I guess from my perspective first to start, um, I think you need both, which is annoying. Um, <laughs> but uh, there are a lot of mid-level positions that say you need a like advanced degree, or there are certain, at least government or like UN positions where it's like to get to this level, like you need to have that degree and a certain number of ex years of experience. So um, I think also when you're starting like I had a few other friends who did this who started their practicums and then now are staying on at the organizations. And so I think that's really great to get um, a job and like foot in the door. Um, but then you have to get into that area where it's like, okay, now I have my master's and you have to, I advocate and like my mentors have advocated for then saying, okay, now how do I negotiate like a different title or a different pay salary um, because now I have that extra qualification and presumably like a year extra of experience. So um, I guess that would be my advice is like always advocate for yourself and say like, this is the amount of years I have. This is the degree I have from Brown or from whatever institution. And like, that's worth a lot. And especially like going into salary negotiations, um, like leverage that and try and um, play it as a, and, and like we said, the skills too, not just like the degree, but like the skills that you're able to sell. But I think it's always still going to be, depending on how much work experience you have before your master's, it's going to be kind of um, an, something you need to navigate afterwards to get to that next level. 
Yeah, and I think that'll that'll lead us to our last question. Um, and if all three of you could answer, just because you work for very different organizations, um, oftentimes the timeline for applying for these positions is relatively short. I get job postings all the time that are open for a week. And the process has many different levels and it's based on experience and, and many other factors that can sometimes be very prescribed in nature. Um, and so high level, what resource would you recommend to a job seeker now who's thinking about how to prepare for the application process in six months from now or two years from now? What resource would you direct them to to like inform the application process in a, a kind of public sector? So um, what I did during my MPH was I read a lot of job postings um, for different organizations, including um, like I, I was kind of thinking I wanted to be a, a state level epidemiologist. That was um, where I interned um, during my MPH as well. So I would read a lot of those job postings for the skills that they posted and then kind of tried to take classes or tailor like um, the skill sets I was building. Um, so I would look at organizations that have openings now that you might not apply because it's like a year away, um, but start building like SAS skills or um, like facilitation skills, um, you know, whatever it is that you think you might need um, and start that process now. Talk to professors who have those skills and take those classes. I would say that um, don't be disappointed. I do feel like it's a very hard, a difficult um, process to get into the federal government. And to be quite honest, um, I don't really think there's a rhyme or a rhyme or reason to the application process. I know that there are people that, you know, they get in on their first try, whether they're applying to a fellowship or to a permanent um, position or to a temporary position. And there are people who have tried for seven years, 10 years and don't get into a position. Um, I think again, that doing those things that apply to every field, making sure that your resume is able to beat this, um, <laughs> beat the computer when it's going through the system, but also backs up and and um, um the skills you actually do have that you're making sure you know um, it's really speaking to the job posting, um, networking as well, um, and. I would just consistently apply. I remember when I applied for this position that I actually didn't think I would get it. I was just applying because the, the CDC had another job opening, but that was the consistency that I had gotten into that if they have a posting up, I'm going to apply and at some point I'll get in. But it was kind of something that I kept in the background. Um, so yes, I'm doing this plan through my more, um, you know, working at my nonprofit. There's a clearer way to move to the positions that I want to, but I'll still keep this um, as an option until it presents itself. Um, and definitely, I think plugging into professional networks um, that also can tell you how it how things work. So I know I personally am, am part of a Facebook group that's called Black Ladies in Public Health. Um, and when I told them I got an interview, and they're extremely helpful. They're the only reason I log onto Facebook, um, but they were extremely helpful. When I told them I got an interview, I got an interview for this position. Can anyone tell me? what it's like to go through a federal interview. And I got tons of responses in the same day. Make sure you're following this format. Make sure you're doing this. Um, don't be shocked if it goes like this. That's how I wasn't shocked that nobody was talking after any of my responses. But um, really plugging in with those networks has helped a tremendous amount. So, yes. I love both pieces of advice that you guys gave and think Yes, look at the job descriptions, like continually looking. And that's also what I've been doing like the last couple of years is just like keeping your eyes open on the organizations that you're interested in and what kind of positions they're posting. And also like, I had to talk to people kind of back to that question about mid-career. It's like, I had to talk to people in those organizations to be like, okay, this is my background. Which like position should I even be applying for? Because the titles go by different things in each organization. Sometimes that you're like, I was this at this organization, but what would I be at this organization? And they're not always the same. So, and sometimes the JDs will tell you like the degree or the years experience, but sometimes people will be like, no, like it's really more like this is what they're looking for. And 
versus what they list as desired versus what they list as required. Um, so it's always helpful to get that insight. Um, but I guess a different piece of advice I would say is like, go find mentors. And that's like where I have personally like found the most like encouragement and support through these processes. Because again, like don't be discouraged. It is like long and it like you'll get more rejections and you get like jobs and my advisor was just like you really just need one job like you just need one yes that like don't I don't know like also don't compare yourself to other people like I think my cohort has been like so supportive of each other and like connecting to each friends or like people we worked with and like not like it's like hard to be like oh well they got this awesome position but it's like I always remind myself like your time is going to come like it's just like everything happens in its own time and like we were saying these positions you just like never know when they're going to open or when they're going to pick you or like um what's going to work out but I think when I was graduating from Brown I was like freaking out about not having a job and the career center was like okay like 90 or more than 90 percent of people have jobs six months after graduation so like don't worry something's gonna happen and like just even now it's been hard like there are a lot of jobs but it's still been like hard of a process and I have friends who are just like getting jobs after like graduating in the spring so um yeah I think just like support each other and I think like seeing these like awesome women in public health like I think that's a great network to have and um and then also the like advisors and academic people um and alumni who are above you. Great, I am so inspired. Thank you for sharing your perspectives. This has been awesome. I think it's been a great balance of like practical and philosophical, uh, which is like the best combination uh, for, for career exploration. So just on behalf of the school, thank you so much for your time and energy and insights and perspectives. Um, I hope you'll keep in touch. And uh, again, to everyone joining us, thanks for participating and we'll have this posted on our webinar page in the next week. So thanks everyone, enjoy the rest of your day.